When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Early on the first day of the week, the disciples of Jesus went to the tomb where he had been buried, only to find that the stone had been rolled away and the tomb was empty. Friends, we gather here as Christ's disciples on the first day of the week to celebrate the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ has been risen from the dead.
people of God, we are witnesses to these things, that Christ died hanging on a cross, that God raised him from the dead on the third day, that he is coming again in glory to reign. This is the good news we tell to all the world. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. And let us join together in prayer. Loving and ever-present God, 
You seek us up and down the roads of life, assuring us we are your beloved children. You choose to give us free will and release us to learn and grow, yet you remain with us. Because of Easter, we now know that nothing can snatch us from your hand or remove us beyond the reach of your care. And so it is that we worship you. We adore you and give thanks to you for this astonishing message of Easter resurrection. Amen. Since sin and death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, all will be made alive in Christ. Trusting in that promise of God, let us together confess our sin. Gracious God, we have heard the good news, how on the third day Christ rose again. Still we look for the living among the dead. You rolled away the stone from the tomb, Still we look for the living among the dead. You sent messengers to proclaim the gospel. Still we look for the living among the dead. You were faithful to your promise. You have done wonderful things. Still we look for the living among the dead. Forgive us, Lord, we pray. Teach us to trust your promise and to believe the good news of salvation. Christ is alive. Jesus is risen from the dead. Amen. Friends, when Christ comes to reign, he will put an end to every ruler, every power, every authority. He will put every enemy under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. As we wait that great and glorious day, we rejoice in the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Well, good morning, guys. I am so glad to have this time with you on Easter morning. My question for you today is, do you like surprises? Now, that might be a hard question to answer because not all surprises are the same. Some surprises can be scary. Suppose you're blowing up a balloon and then it suddenly pops. You didn't expect that to happen, and when it does, the loud noise might frighten you. That's a scary surprise. The same thing can happen if a brother or sister or a friend hops out from behind a door and says, boo. You might scream and jump back. That's a scary surprise. Then there are happy surprises. We like those best. Perhaps a friend you haven't seen for a long time comes to visit. Your family plans a surprise birthday party for you. Or maybe you received a 100% on a test at school you didn't expect to do that well on. Or maybe you win a contest or meet a new friend. These are all pleasant surprises. Probably the biggest surprise in all of history occurred to Mary Magdalene. She is a woman who knew and followed Jesus, and she was very sad when he died. She was so sad, she went to sit by his tomb. She had quite a bad surprise when she got there and saw that the tomb he'd been put in was empty and Jesus was gone. She was so sad, she began crying. And as she cried, she looked into the empty tomb and saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying. They asked her, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. Then a man standing outside the tomb asks her why she is crying. Because Mary is so sad and crying, she doesn't recognize that it is Jesus that she is talking to until he says her name. And then she recognizes that the man is Jesus. What a surprise it must have been for Mary to see Jesus again after he had died. At Easter time, this is the happy surprise that we talk about, that Jesus rose from the dead and went to be with God in heaven. This is the happy surprise that makes us Christians. This is the happy surprise that lets us know who we are and whose we are. This is the happy surprise of God's love. And that's some pretty good news. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for Jesus, who gave his life for us so we could be close to you. Thank you for surprising us with your love, even when we don't deserve it. Because we are yours, we get to be surprised every day with your love. Help us to surprise others every day with your love. Amen.
As we prepare our hearts to approach God's holy word, let us pray that the Spirit would give us illumination. Living God, by your Holy Spirit, open our eyes to see the light, the new light of this day. Open our lips to tell of the empty tomb. Open our hearts to believe the good news through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The gospel message this morning is taken from the book of John in the 18th chapter. Let us listen to what God is telling us this morning. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran, and she went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And she said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He too saw the linen wrappings lying there. And the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by themselves. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet, the disciples did not understand that he must rise from the dead, according to the scriptures. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary, Mary stood weeping outside of the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look in, and she saw two angels in white sitting at the place where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said, they have taken my Lord away, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around, and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, Mary said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, that I may take him away. And then Jesus said, Mary. Mary said in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for as yet I have not ascended to my Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them he had said these things to her. This is the good news of the Lord. Amen. Well, blessed Easter to you. On behalf of all of the staff here at Christ Presbyterian Church, happy Easter. This is the day of resurrection. We celebrate the resurrection of of Jesus Christ. It is a, a celebration. It is a festival day, as we might call it. As I begin the sermon, there are three short sermons this morning. I get to start. And I'm starting by asking a question I bet no other pastor will be asking his or her congregation this morning. Just you. You. Have you ever faced a firing squad? Have you ever faced a a firing squad? Perhaps another way of asking the question is, How close have you come to death? 
war, sickness, accident. How close to death have you come and what are these the length of your days? I'm not speaking of being close to another who is dying or has died. No, I'm, I'm talking about you, me. How close have you come to experiencing your own physical death? And how did you or how do you think you would react or cope, endure? Seems to me facing a firing squad would be a pretty good test of your theology of death, so to speak. And so wrote Walter Sisek, a Jesuit missionary to Russia who served 23 years in confinement in heavy, heavy labor in the, the Russian work camps. Sizek was convicted of espionage on behalf of the Vatican in 1939, just at the dawn of the big war. He wasn't released until 1963. Of all the stories he tells, this one captures my imagination. He writes, There had been a revolt of the prisoners at Camp 5 in Norsk. And when troops were called in to put down the riot, they then divided the prisoners up into small groups and marched them off. I was rounded up in a group of about 30 and led down to a sand pit about a mile away. We never for a moment thought we would see the soldiers line up five yards in front of us and with rifles ready, waiting only for the command to shoot. The command was given, raise your rifles. The command was given, they were leveled at their heads. For a moment, none of us really understood what was happening. Then the realization that we were actually looking into gun barrels awaiting only the command to fire, it came crashing into our consciousness with a force that stopped everything. My stomach turned once and went numb. My heart stopped. I'm sure I forgot to breathe. I couldn't move a muscle of my body. My mind went blank. Then it was, apparently, God intervened. And Sizek's group of 30 were miraculously spared. During his continuing years of confinement, he reflected on his reaction during those moments of the suicide, or I'm sorry, of the, of the firing squad. At one level, he remembers feeling terror with all of its force. An animalistic instinct took over, adrenaline flowed, and panic seized his body. This was his physical reaction. But Sizek also remembers another aspect of his reaction. Call it a spiritual reaction. There in the Russian prison camp, he was contemplated, he has con contemplated death many times, death coming in a variety of ways. And, and this is what he writes about those times. The thought of death itself did not terrify me had not terrified me through the entire war, my prison time, the prison camps. If the good news of Christianity is anything, it is this, that death has no hidden terror, has no mystery. It's not something we must fear. It's not the end of life, of the soul, of the person. On this day, Easter Sunday, 2021, we are called to remember that, that Christ's death on the cross was not in itself the central act of salvation, but his death and resurrection. Truth, truth be told, Christians don't really have a theology of death. We can only have a theology of life and living. Any fear of death, need not consume me in my living. The resurrection of Jesus Christ liberates me now, right now. Death has lost its power to consume my everyday thought, of darkening my every action, of, of constraining or constricting any of my 
hope. I am free now. Yes, someday our bodies will die. But that hardly stands in the way of our living now. Death has lost its sting. Thanks be to God. This is something to celebrate. Our reading from the Hebrew Scriptures comes to us from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. Let us listen again for God's holy word. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-matured wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-matured wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Sisters and brothers, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. So these last few years, there has been one particular quote that has been resonating deeply with me, which comes from a theologian, Robert Weber, where he writes that the road to the future runs through the past. So sometimes in order to understand where you're going, you should go back and see where you have been. And that is why on this Easter Sunday morning, as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I want us to turn our hearts back to the prophet Isaiah for just a few minutes, because to see where we're going, it's good to see where we have been. In the few verses that we just heard a moment ago, the prophet paints this portrait of a feast that is far off into the future. This banquet will feature the richest foods, the very best wines, and we're supposed to imagine that this is more extravagant than any dinner we've ever had on Easter, Thanksgiving, or Christmas, all of those even combined, and even better than the most expensive meal you've ever had at any restaurant, right? Isaiah is actually saying God is the very one who makes the feast. I don't think we could find a better chef. But just who are the guests what is the occasion for this meal on the mountain of God? Well, the guests are invited to the table, and they're made up of all peoples, all nations. They and we are there together to celebrate the total destruction of death itself. Indeed, Isaiah says that the Lord of hosts will swallow up death, a beautiful poetic way of saying that Death is gone forever, never to return. Then the Lord will wipe away our tears. The idea here is there's no more need to grieve that separation that comes in death because we now know death is no more. God has triumphed, and we have hope. We have the assurance that this life is not the end. And of course, as I revisit these passages from Isaiah, I cannot help but hear echoes of what the Apostle Paul writes over in 1 Corinthians. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, when this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? And then I hear these same sorts of sentiments echoed over in John's revelation. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be His peoples, and God Himself will be with them. 
He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. Indeed, the prophets, the apostles, the evangelists, they together paint this beautiful portrait of paradise for us. And when we revisit these ancient traditions, our ancient traditions, and we weave these beautiful images together, the colors on the canvas come alive. And we step back and we behold what later traditions call the marriage feast of the Lamb, where all the faithful of every tribe and every tongue will gather to celebrate God's ultimate triumph As Isaiah first said, so we Christians can echo and affirm, this is our God. We have waited for Him so that He might save us. Indeed, we confess that Jesus is our Lord, the one of whom the prophets spoke. We have waited for Him and He has come. He has saved us. Let us rejoice and let us celebrate. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And from Paul's first letter to the people of Corinth, from the 15th chapter, Paul writes, Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received in which also you stand, through which you also are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaimed to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I have handed on to you, as of first importance, what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of them who are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, He appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is in me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim and so you have come to believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As followers of God, we sometimes find ourselves playing catch up to what God is doing. On the day of resurrection, the disciples and Mary Magdalene, who'd been told very directly by Jesus earlier what was to happen, They were still surprised to see Jesus rise from the dead and to understand the hope that that provided. The Israelites, living in the fear of death from the nations around them, needed the reminder of God's amazing provision in order to trust that they could celebrate what God had done. And here, here in Acts, we find the Apostle Peter just coming to the realization that if God is truly God, then God is not merely over all people. God must be for all people. Now, Peter has just had a vision that his previous understanding of who is in and who is out doesn't match up with what God has been doing all along. In Acts, we find Peter giving a sermon to a Gentile soldier and his household, all of whom Peter would have written off previously as being profane or unclean, certainly not people with whom he should associate. 
In fact, Peter is so late to the game that a few minutes later, while Peter is still speaking, God's Holy Spirit comes down to all who are listening while he's still talking. So I imagine if Peter were Presbyterian, it would be here that he'd be frantically flipping through his order of service, confused at what was supposed to come next. You see, we're no better, though, at being ready for what God is doing 2,000 years later. 2,000 years later, and we are still wondering what Jesus' death and resurrection mean. I like how preacher Will Willimon describes our circumstance. He says, faith, when it comes down to it, is often our breathless attempt to keep up with the redemptive activity of God, to keep asking ourselves, what is God doing? Where on earth is God going now? Throughout Scripture and church history, we find examples of, of people being distracted by, by fear or death or the, or the world around them such that they miss what God is doing today. And right now, you and I, we could be distracted by what separates us, by a, a virus, by the challenges of life, by what keeps us from experiencing the hope and the celebration of God. Or we could take a hint from the Apostle Peter. Get out of your comfort zone. Share what you see God is doing, even if you're not sure 100%. It may be surprising. It may even challenge what you have thought. But if we can share the gospel message that in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection that the world has begun to change and that God is still at work, God is still offering healing, salvation, and hope, well, then I think joining us in unity will happen in ways we never thought possible. And so today, today I pray you experience the hope of the resurrection. I pray that you find where God is inviting you to celebrate. And I pray that you share the amazing and continually surprising news that God is still at work in the world. Hope, celebrate, share. You might just be surprised at what happens next. Thanks be to God. Amen.
today as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Together, let us affirm our faith. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to eternal life. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as we turn our hearts to God in prayer this morning, you are invited to respond. Whenever you hear the phrase, and so we pray, you are invited to proclaim, O Lord of glory. And so we pray, O Lord of glory. Risen and reigning Lord, truly you are a high priest who has passed through the heavens Truly you were tested as we are and yet were without sin. With boldness we approach your throne, deeply assured of your mercy and grace in our time of need. And so we pray, O Lord of glory, your rising and your reigning give hope to your people. May all who live without hope today taste and see that you are good. And so we pray, O Lord of glory. Your rising and your reigning call us, your people, to testify to your goodness. Equip each of us today to be bold witnesses of Easter news. So we pray, O Lord of glory. Your rising and your reigning call the nations of the world to stop their scheming and seek your peace. May your Spirit convict all people to submit to your rule and to pursue true peace. So we pray, O Lord of glory. Your rising and your reigning call each of us to turn from the path of death to the path of obedience and life. Send your Spirit to strengthen our resolve and help us to live as people of life and light. So we pray, O Lord of glory. Your rising and your reigning bring life and light and healing. May all who suffer in the valley of the shadow of death and disease know your healing presence. So we pray, O Lord of glory. Your rising and your reigning are first fruits of all that is to come. Justice joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. May your kingdom come quickly. So we pray, O Lord of glory. May we, your Easter people, never fail to bless and thank you for your immeasurable love and sure promises. All praise to you, risen Christ, who with the Father and Spirit lives in perfect communion forever and ever. And hear us now as together we pray the prayer 
that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we are Christ Presbyterian Church. God has placed us here in the city center of Canton that here we may bring him honor and glory and witness the kingdom of God. Our life together is a sign of that kingdom, so we consider our life together. We look at the church calendar um, and we ponder how we might each um, serve and, and be involved in the life which is the church. Again, on this Easter morning, on behalf of the staff, I wish you all a very blessed Easter. Uh, and as we look forward um, to live uh, renewed, uh, resurrected lives, um, a couple things to be mindful of. Beginning next Sunday, that is seven days from today, uh, the congregation will return to a regular 1030 gathered worship in the sanctuary. We do ask you to make reservations. We feel comfortable with about 100 people uh, gathered in this space, um, but it is time, and it all seems well enough that we might gather together live at 1030 to worship together. We will continue to live stream that service at 1030 on both YouTube and Facebook, um, understanding that for some that is still the more prudent way to gather together for worship. But again, be mindful, next Sunday we return to a gathered worship, 1030, here in the sanctuary of Christ Church. If you come or if you watch, you will see next week um, new furniture up in the chancel, a new communion table, a new baptismal font, a new pulpit. Um, each will, will speak uh, symbolically as to its purpose and its nature. Uh, as an item of uh, worship among us, as, a, as an item that helps us and leads us and speaks to us of the nature of worship. So I invite you to be paying attention to that as well. There are many, many other things for us to consider, and instead of taking time on this Easter celebration Sunday, I would encourage you to go to the church website and, and find the order of worship and turn there and, and pay attention to all the announcements. As I say week after week, um, participate as, as you are able. Finally, we continue to be grateful for the tithes and offerings that this congregation has continued to, to make in order uh, to sustain this ministry, uh, this proclamation, this worship, this outreach, this fellowship, this time of study. Um, we realize that in, in these days, um, it's easy to forget that which has changed um, and become different. As we return to a, a more normal schedule, uh, it is again appropriate for us to give thanks for your faithfulness uh, throughout the, the last year and plus, year plus. With that in mind, will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, on this Easter Sunday, we remember that you not only died for us, but you rose for us. Now we ask that you take us, that by the hot power of your Holy Spirit, you resurrect our spirits anew. Remove from us any fear, any worry. Remind us again that death has lost its sting, that life is worth celebrating and sharing. So take us and use us. And this for your glory, this for the life of your kingdom in our midst. We pray these things in Christ's most perfect, resurrected name. Amen.
The Lord is risen. He has risen indeed. Let us now go into the world as people who do not fear death, any death, who do not fear life, but who know life worthy of celebrating and the good news worthy of sharing. Let us go. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, let us go. Amen.